All right, welcome to the show, Andrew. I'm so glad to have you here. It's good to see your face. Great to see you, and thanks so much for having me on. Of course. Um, I've told you this story before, but um, we met through mutual friends, Pat and Kim Dossett, and I remember um, kind of being fascinated by you when we first met because here you are, this neuroscientist from Stanford, a super smart guy, and you also have this gift for identifying people's spirit, spirit animals. And I thought, gosh, what a unique combination of characteristics coming <laughs> together here. That was so cool. Can we talk about your spirit animal gift before we get into anything, please? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I, I love animals. I love animal behavior of all kinds. Ever since I was a kid, I've just been fascinated by how different animals move and their specializations, you know, a diving bird that catches fish has to do all this crazy stuff like adjust for the refractory index of the water, which means that where it sees the fish is it knows that the fish isn't there in order to catch it. Amazing stuff. And I'm just, I'm um, consistently um, delighted by the gifts uh, that animals give us in terms of what they show us in terms of their behavior. And I have this weird, um, sense that when I meet somebody, my brain starts tracking um, possible animals that they kind of map onto. And it's not necessarily based on how they look physically, although sometimes it is. A lot of it has to do with how they move, their cadence of speech, like how fast they talk or how slowly they talk, um, and just kind of how still they are. You know, some animals, like my bulldog is very still. And some animals, if you look at a pit bull, pit bull has like kind of a low level of kind of undulation and agitation. That's why they sometimes make people a little nervous because you never know which direction they're going to go. Mm -hmm. Whereas with my bulldog Costello, you know, the one direction he's going to go is nowhere. He's going to stay in the same place <laughs> unless he has a really good reason to move. He's not going to move. So when I meet somebody, I, I don't intentionally do this. It's just like a reflex for me. I start thinking about it and it t sometimes takes me a couple years of spending time with somebody to get to know them and and to and then it just leaps to mind and I usually try and check with um, their significant other or a family member to try and get confirmation that I'm on the right track. But here's the the three rules of of selecting animal um, spirits or energies, whatever they are. I don't do this professionally. I obviously I do it recreationally. Um, I I think everybody has an aquatic version of themselves. I think everyone has an avian or, you know, flying version of themselves. And I think everyone has a land dwelling terrestrial version of themselves. Okay. So the best example I can give is what, you know, when I met you and Rory, um, very quickly, I started, I was like, you know, Rory, Rory's, the, he's a tall guy. He's a big guy. And um, I'm pretty tall, but he's, he's, you know, he taller than me. And I was like, he's very, very tall, very still. He's a big guy, so he's got a lot of power to him, but, um, and he's a great runner and great athlete and, you know, everything movement. Um, and, but just observing him and being with him, I was like, you know what? He's like an Irish wolfhound. <laughs> this guy is, you know, I used to go to the dog shows, the Westminsters and the other dog no shows, way. and I, I wouldn't, I don't watch the dogs parading around in the arena in the middle. That doesn't interest me. What I like to do is go to all, in back, you can go see all the different dog breeds. So you're seeing these extreme forms of each breed. Um, and the wolfhounds are amazing because they all sit up very, they have this like regal stance. Rory has this amazing posture. And, um, and yet there's a real calm to them, despite the fact that they have tremendous power. When a wolfhound decides it's going to run or pursue something, it's incredible. It's, it's an amazing thing to see. So immediately I, I thought, I think Rory's an Irish wolfhound. So after that meal, I sent you a picture and Rory and I said, <laughs> Are, am I on the right track? And and you said, yeah, I think I think you said, yeah, absolutely. Spot on, so, spot on. Spot on. So anyway, that's that's a long-winded way of saying it just is a reflex and it comes from my love of biology and the fact that humans are just yet another species on the planet. Uh, we have a lot of great qualities, but I think that a lot of the more um, kind of core aspects to our movement, our speech, our behavior, our demeanor, how we react under stress, how we um, how we show joy, all those things um, kind of surface as uh, a resemblance to other animals sometimes. Yes. Well, I look forward to the day when you identify what my spirit animal is. And until then- I have then, some ideas. Oh, <laughs> I have some ideas. But it's always, you know, but I, I'm going to hold on. I'm going to run it by Rory first and then yes, we'll see. Yes, I don't I want ran, you rushing into it. Oh, that's right. Great. 
Um, okay, so we're in a really crazy time right now in this with this pandemic. I mean, these are unprecedented times, so much stress, anxiety. People are dealing with everything. Like there's people losing their jobs. There's the physical stresses of people's health and their loved one's health. And then there's people working in, you know, the front lines trying to take care of us all. And um, yeah, the financial burdens and all, I mean, there's so many things, people at home with their kids feeling like, you know, they have no help and um, the feeling of isolation, people not being able to be with the people they love or be with their friends. So there's so much going on right now. What, like, how are you handling this situation? Like, how is this time for you as, as a scientist, as a person? Well, thank you for asking. So um, I'm fortunate that, you know, I have a home with a yard and I have some space where I can move and I've got my dog here. So we're healthy. Um, my lab is still somewhat active, although with some safety guidelines in place, um, we're able to do certain things, um, certain experiments. We're, do we're running some experiments remotely. Um, we're doing a big study right now on, on breathing and stress control with um, undergraduates from Stanford um, that we've equipped with devices to monitor sleep and heart rate variability and things. So that stuff is continuing. It's been a, a, um, a, a productive time in terms of writing. I just finished a book. Um, so I was able to turn that in and, and a lot of scientific writing and grant writing and reviewing. So I'm busier than ever, which um, for me helps. Um, but I, of course, am really concerned about you know those that are out of work and the amount of stress that I see out there. But from where I uh, from where I stand, I'm I feel you know I'm my needs my basic needs are taken care of, um, and most of my efforts have been about the lab, uh, my dog, and trying to uh, get you know tools for people to understand and and uh, work with their stress and and even in some cases um, to really be able to thrive in this in this time of it. tremendous yeah. stress and uncertainty really. Yeah. I'm really excited to get to that because I think you have some excellent tools that people can really benefit from. Um, first off, let's talk a little bit about kind of fear, anxiety, and stress. What is the difference between those things? Yeah, that's a great question. And to be honest, there really aren't formal definitions of those that everyone can agree on, but we can come up with a couple of guidelines. So um, anxiety and stress are kind of similar. Um, they both involve changes to our physiology, our body shifts, it becomes more alert and more agitated generally. Um, so, you know, it makes it harder to rest and relax. Um, anxiety and stress can happen even in the absence of, of something, you know. So uh, fear is a little different because fear tends to also include elements of, of uncertainty, although anxiety and stress can as well. And fear often can be eliminated by not interacting with the thing that you're afraid of. Okay. So not always, but let's say I have a fear of spiders, which I don't, but let's say I had a fear of spiders. Um, I don't like snakes, but spiders don't bother me in my case. Um, so let's say I have a, a fear of spiders. I can just do various things to avoid engaging that feeling of fear. Now, if I I'm forced to, you know, see one or if someone's talking about them, I might feel some stress and anxiety, but I'm not really afraid of the conversation. It's more, um, you know, at a distance, we tend to feel, feel things like stress and anxiety. Now, anxiety and stress can spark with no apparent reason. You know, we study people in the lab um, who have uh, generalized anxiety. So they just generally wake up feeling too anxious. There doesn't even need to necessarily be a uh, something that's causing that anxiety. So um, they're overlapping. You can't have stress. You can't have anxiety without stress. You can't have fear without stress and anxiety, but you can have anxiety without fear, right? And you can have stress without fear. So fear is kind of the, the, the one that includes all of them. And it also includes this element of uncertainty. And I think right now people are feeling a lot of fear because there's so much uncertainty, not just about when we're going to get out of quarantine, but also, you know, what's going to happen in the fall? Is this virus going to mutate? Um, there are a lot of issues that um, are uncertain. And humans are very good at dealing with stress, and they're very good at dealing with anxiety, actually. Um, we find ways to cope, some healthy, some unhealthy. We'll talk about some of the healthy ways. 
But um, uncertainty is something that our, our species just really doesn't like. We like to know what's going to happen. We feel better when we know what's going to happen, even if we don't like what we're hearing. So the uncertainty is real and it's having a real impact. And you, you've said this before, but your lab has specifically studied fear, anxiety, and kind of the different calming responses. So this is something that you're very familiar with and you've actually been doing a lot of work on. You actually That's dove right. with great white sharks in the name of fear research. Is that right? That's right. So my lab works on, um, on vision, on visual repair for uh, diseases like glaucoma. We're trying to restore vision to the blind and we're running clinical trials. We do other studies. Okay. That's probably separate from this conversation, but I'd be happy to talk about it if you like. And then um, uh, my lab also works on stress, fear, and anxiety, where you study respiration, breathing, and vision and how those impact those things, how you can push through those things. And as part of the buildup of our lab, we, um, we needed uh, stimuli, as we call them, experiences that people could come to the lab and, and have using virtual reality while we measure, we record from people, uh, from neurons in their brain, we record things like sweating, heart rate, um, pupil size, you know, the size of the pupils of the eyes, lots of different things. And um, we have different experiences, heights, snakes, spiders, and one of them was swimming a great white shark. So I have a good friend, Michael Muller, who's a photographer down in uh, Los Angeles, and in addition to being a very successful uh, you know, uh, photographer for the movie industry and portrait photographer generally, he uh, cage exit dives with great white sharks. And so we built underwater rigs to take VR cameras down there, and um, he taught me how to do it. So I, I, I did go down there, I, I cage exited. I'm not sure I'm gonna do it again. It was a wonderful experience. It's not something I recommend for everybody, but we, I survived. I'm back. And cage and, um, exit means that you're out of the cage with a great white shark near you. That's right. So the cage, oh, they, there's a cage up at the top behind the boat. Then they, they lower one about 40 feet below. And then we had permits to do this because you're actually not allowed. It's illegal to cage exit, but we had permits from um, the Mexican government, from the biopreserve to do this. And then we would exit the cage and swim with the sharks so that we could get really up close footage, like almost in their mouths. Oh um, and it was, oh you know, it, it, it was a, it was a truly transformative experience. And it's something that you only want to do with people who really understand the behaviors of these animals. We were out there with oceanographers who have spent a lifetime working with great white sharks who understand how to do this and not get eaten. Um, there were some moments of high adrenaline, um, but the goal was achieved. We brought back the footage. We built this VR environment in my lab where people can come in and uh, experience different types of stressors, different types of fear. We can look at how people's breathing changes, how their vision changes. And then we also study and create tools that people can use outside the laboratory that allow people to calm themselves in real time. Because that's for us that the one of the ultimate goals is, you know, there are things like meditation and exercise and Lots of things that can really help people um, get more in touch with their mindfulness. But when stress hits, it hits so fast that you know it's it's unreasonable to act for anyone to expect themselves not to get stressed. So we want to develop what I call real time tools to be able to push back on stress and um, engage the calming response. So the, the shark dive was in the name of that mission, oh. uh, but uh, it was great. It was a great adventure. Well, as one of the many people who will benefit from all of your research and your techniques, I am grateful for you sacrificing yourself in that way. You're most welcome. Pat <laughs> Dossett, our, our, our common friend, also joined. And of course, um, his uh, work as a, you know, in the SEAL teams, he's now out, but um, he's an expert diver. And uh, it, uh, he went before I did. I'll be honest. He, he cage exited before I did. So. Uh, oh, you guys. Wow. I've, a cage diving with great whites has actually was something on my bucket list. I'm not sure. Things have shifted since I've had a child, but for a while that was on my list, but never being outside of the cage. So that's a whole nother sphere. You guys are yeah. crazy. But um, moving on. So I want to talk about the calming techniques. But before that, can you help us just understand briefly like what is happening in our body and our mind when we're stressed, when we're under stress? And I know short periods of stress are necessary, but long periods of stress can be problematic. Can you just differentiate between the two? Sure. So um, I'll answer the second part first and just say that 
um, brief bouts of stress actually enhance our immune system. They are actually quite healthy. Um, we sometimes, and by brief, it can sometimes be days or weeks. You know, we've all heard how terrible stress is, but many people have experienced working really, really hard in school or um, at work or to take care of a loved one and then finally resting and then getting sick. And the reason is that when we're in a, uh, a mode of high adrenaline output and push, 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 even when we're sleep deprived, it's not something I recommend, but even when we're, we're getting less sleep than we need, and we're pushing really hard, the nervous system sends signals to the organs of the body that produce the kinds of cells that fight infections, bacteria and viruses, and it mobilizes against those infections. And this makes a lot of sense when you think about the stress response as this kind of ancient generic way of mobilizing us and making us more resilient. And that's really what it does. We don't like the way it makes us feel because it makes us feel agitated. Most people would prefer to be calm, but that agitation was designed to mob literally to move us from a place that we're in to a new place or, um, you know, or in some cases to be able to fight, in some cases to be able to move. It wasn't always about tigers attacking caves. A lot of times it might've been, um, historically, it might've been about um, famine or even just less food than you would like or seeking water. So you don't want to get sick while you're in pursuit of that better territory. And so the stress response mobilizes the immune response. Now, if it goes on too long, the immune system and the nervous system start to peter out. You've probably heard of things like adrenal fatigue and um, or adrenal burnout, um, the immune system can crash, things like that. So the ideal situation is where you're experiencing stress and then you're not letting it continue too long. But but brief bouts of stress- What is too, too long? Like, what is it? I know there's not like well, a definitive answer, but like, yeah. you, you really don't want to be in a state where you're- um, where you're not sleeping well for more than one or two nights in a row. And, and we can talk about tools to enhance sleep because there's some excellent tools out there that are research supported that are cost-free and, and very effective that I think most people have, haven't heard about because the, the research is fairly recent. Um, so I would say if you're experiencing bouts of stress that go on that are very intense and last hours and hours, um, then you better have some techniques to push back on those so that you can sleep well or that, or so that you can recover from that. If, if you're starting to feel, you know, elevated bl blood pressure, uh, elevated, uh, heartbeat, um, quickening of breathing, shortness of breath for long periods of time, it's really something to pay attention to and just start engaging some tools. But just really briefly, the stress response involves Something happens in the brain first, then a signal is sent to the body, and that something could be detecting a real threat, like reading a headline, or you're worried that you, something happened to a family member, or it could just be spontaneous. It could just happen out of nowhere in some cases. That's what generalized anxiety is. Signal is sent to the body. The adrenal glands, which sit uh, right above your kidneys in your lower back, they liberate adrenaline into your body, and you're going to feel agitated. Your heart rate is going to speed up. That's very healthy. That shows you have a healthy brain-body connection. Once that hits, it's all of our job to try and calm ourselves using specific tools. But the, the time that it takes from when stress hits to the adrenaline being released in our body is so fast, it's about a half a second, that you really can't expect yourself not to get stressed. The expectation should be that you're gonna then push back on stress. But people sometimes get stressed that they're stressed. It's what I call mm -hmm. meta-stress. They're like, I'm stressed that I'm stressed. I don't wanna be stressed. And that's just what that's doing is that's sending more signals from the brain to the adrenals to continue to secrete this adrenaline. Whereas if you can just accept, okay, my adrenaline's been triggered and now I'm gonna to work to try and counter that, then you're gonna be a lot better off. Okay. All right, let's talk about some of these calming techniques and the tools that can help us kind of cope with stress because you've got some great okay. ones. So um, there are a couple ways that you can do this, but let's start with breathing because uh, many of your listeners, I'm, I'm assuming are familiar with mindfulness meditation and the incorporation mm -hmm. of breathing and yogic practices. There are two kinds of breathing practices. Um, one are what I call um, offline tools. So this would be breath work. This would be taking a few minutes each day to do something specific that can help calm you down and make you even more resilient to stress. So I'll give a couple examples of what those are. 
a popular one is just to sit down and do five minutes of pure nasal breathing. A lot of people say, well, my, my, um, I have a deviated septum or I can't breathe through my nose. That's because you're not breathing through your nose enough. Most of the time, it's mm -hmm. because people, the, the sinuses of the nose actually dilate as you breathe through the nose more. There are a lot of reasons to, switch, to be nasal breathing as often as possible whenever you're not speaking or eating. Especially now because it's safer, right? <laughs> also. It's safer. It, so the nose actually has enzymes that, um, that break down bacteria and break down viral particles in better than the mouth, far better. Um, and so that's one reason. The other reason is breathing through the nose tends to shift the ratio of these two things, oxygen and carbon dioxide, to, in, a, in ways that are, that are generally more calming. Not always, but in, in general. And the other thing, and this is mainly for um, parents and kids, mouth breathing has really bad effects on the whole shape of the jaw and face and teeth organization and the way the tongue is in the mouth. It can lead to constriction of the, the throat and breathing that way. And it can, really, um, it can really disrupt cognitive function by not getting enough blood flow and oxygen to the brain. There's a great book, I actually have it behind me, so I'll grab it. It's, I didn't write it and I actually, um, these, the authors are my colleagues at Stanford, but this is a book um, by Sandra Kahn and um, Paul Ehrlich. Um, it's called Jaws, The Story of a Hidden Epidemic. And it has some remarkable examples of uh, people, mainly kids, um, that, uh, for instance, this is, a, I'll show you this. I hopefully it'll show up on here. You see this child with his very, oh, very yeah. little, pretty nice, nice shaped face and, you know, kind of young kid. This, I'm not making this up. This kid got a pet gerbil. The gerbil, he was allergic to it, and he developed this allergy where he became a mouth breather. And just look at the transformation in the shape wow. of his face. Wow. Oh, my gosh. So that's remarkable. It's remarkable. And, and there are a lot of examples of this. Um, and, I, you know, and I don't want to make this all about the, the book, but this, this young lady, this is her when she was a mouth breather. And this is the photo of her a year later as switching over to nasal breathing, complete restructuring of the facial structure. So um, aesthetics aside, right, what nasal breathing really um, can help a lot of features. And this is true for adults too, because the, sh the shape of the sinuses, the shape of the face is actually what we call plastic. It can actually move and change. So nasal breathing for stress is also very good because it tends to slow down our breathing. And slowing, if, if you were going to do one thing to control your stress, I'd say concentrate on trying to be a nasal breather more than a mouth breather and slow down your breath. So try and get down to maybe three or four breaths per minute. And so those are long breaths, sometimes with pauses at the top and pauses at the bottom. And you can train your system to do this automatically. So that's sort of away from stress. That's just kind of daily life stuff. There's a technique that you can do if you want to raise your threshold for stress. So you want to make it so that stress doesn't hit as easily. And that's a, a process called super oxygenation breathing. Um, some people call it TUMO breathing. If you've ever heard of Wim Hof breathing or Kundalini breathing, they tend to incorporate these kinds of techniques. And that involves doing a lot of deep inhales and quick exhales. So I'm not going to do it here because it'll make a lot of noise, but it would be big inhale, Quick exhale, big inhale, quick exhale, and that has the the um, effect. Is it through your actually, mouth or nose? In through know. the nose, out through the mouth. Typically, I there's some methods that are just through the mouth. I don't. I, I'm not a big fan of those because actually people can pass out. Um, you get kind of dizzy. But these super oxygenated methods are actually designed to get people really alert, like really, really alert. And then you're supposed to sit calmly with that adrenaline in your system. Now, there's, the logic to this is, um, as a colleague of mine, David Spiegel, in the Department of Psychiatry at Stanford, he's an MD, he says, um, you know, it's not just about the state that you're in, it's how you got there, and whether or not you had anything to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. And so what this, these super oxygenated techniques like TUMO and Kundalini and Wim Hof breathing, they're really designed for people to push themselves into stress deliberately. You'd say, well, why would you want to do that? but then learning how to calm their mind while they're in that stressful mode. And um, so that's, that's an approach that um, requires a little bit of caution because they, it, some people get really agitated or can feel panic when they do that. But nasal breathing and slowing your breathing is a great way to stay calm throughout the day. You can even do it while you're running or exercising. It actually will make sure that you stay, um, you can actually um, 
perform much better often when you're just pure nasal breathing. Nasal breathing while you're while running or biking. It can take a day or so to get used to, but um, a lot of people find that they can perform better. And there's some Hmm. um, evidence from the exercise physiology community to support that. Now, the other kind of, of breathing is this real or tools rather that involve breathing for stress or what I call real time tools. And these are tools that my lab has, um, has really been focused on studying and developing. And the one that I'm a really big fan of is based on a paper that was published in the journal nature showing that there are neurons in the brainstem, this deep brain area that control sighing. So we have neurons that control laughing. We have neurons that control coughing. We have neurons that control speech and we have neurons that control sighing. Now, these neurons normally cause sighing throughout the night, so while people are sleeping, and occasionally- Wait, can I stop you for a second, just since I I know very little about the, like, not very little, but, so with, when you talk about a neuron, is it like when I sigh, that neuron fires, or is it, like, how does that, how do they interact? Is it the neuron first and then the sigh, or? Uh, It's a great question. Um, It's both. So when these neurons are active, you sigh. When you sigh, these neurons ah. are active. So a lot of the, the circuits in the brain and body work in these kind of loops where um, it's sort of like, and I don't know how good the evidence is for this, but when people say, when I'm happy, I smile. And when I smile, I feel happier. Yeah, it's yeah. not quite the same because if I'm really upset and I smile, I don't immediately feel happy. But if I'm immediately happy and I smile, so it's a little bit of a stronger effect. So it tends to run brain to body. But what we're talking about here is the way that the body can feed back to the brain to control the way we feel. So there are these neurons in the brainstem that control sighing. And they're remarkable because they actually make sure that we breathe in a very particular way. So when you're feeling stressed, the last thing you want to do is take a deep breath. That's the exact opposite advice. What you really want to do is take a long exhale. However, the best way to calm down quickly using breathing that I'm aware of is to breathe in deeply through the nose. And then before you exhale, breathe in a little bit more through the nose. So a double inhale and then a long exhale through the mouth. That's what I call a proper sigh. And it engages these neurons and the calming response. So I'll do it for you because it would be unfair for me to describe it without actually doing it. So I'm gonna breathe in through my nose. So it's a big inhale through the nose, then I'm sneaking a little bit more air in through my nose, and then a long exhale through the mouth. And what that does is it balances the ratio of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the bloodstream and lungs. So we breathe in oxygen, that oxygen goes into our bloodstream, it then is distributed to the cells of our body, but we also have to remove this gas called carbon dioxide and we do that by exhaling so if carbon dioxide goes too high we can start to feel agitated we need carbon dioxide but in order to balance carbon dioxide and oxygen in the correct way this double inhale long exhale is the tool that mother nature built to readjust our nervous system so if you watch a person sleeping which is a little depending on who that is that might be appropriate or not (laughs) But they will do this periodically throughout sleep. They'll inhale and then there'll be a little Mm -hmm. chest rise and then exhale. My bulldog Costello does this all day long, mostly because he's sleeping all day long. But occasionally you'll see an animal or a person um, blow off stress this way. They'll go. So if you want to push back on stress and engage the calming response really fast, I recommend doing one to three of what I'm of these, what I'm calling proper size. And because of the effect on carbon dioxide and oxygen in the bloodstream and lungs, and because of the effect that it has on the brain, it can really engage the calming response. And that's, so that's one tool that I think most people find very useful. The one that goes with it that is quite useful is to use vision. So we often don't think about our eyes as controlling our internal state. We normally just think that our eyes are for seeing objects and faces and they're for that too. But the original function of the eyes was to tell the brain when to be awake and when to be asleep. We can talk about sleep in a little bit, but it turns out that when you're focused on something very intensely, like if we're looking at one another, having a conversation, people are on Zooms a lot right now, they're on their phones a lot, if you're tending to a child or anything, 
that focus, the actual pointing your eyes to a single location engages these areas of the brain that are involved in vigilance and attention. It's not necessarily stressful, but it's work. And across the day, it can start to feel fatiguing. It can start to feel like your mind is drifting. Some people even think they have ADD when in fact, they just start putting a lot of attention to things and they're fatiguing. You can relax your whole nervous system very quickly by doing what's called, the yogis would call it soft gaze, but I, it's more, more specifically, it's panoramic vision. So what you do is keeping your eyes and head still, so you're not looking around like this or looking, moving your eyes around, just keeping your eyes and head still. I'm looking at you, but now I'm gonna dilate my gaze I'm gonna, so that I can see the walls on either side of the room, the roof, my, and ultimately what you wanna do is you wanna see yourself in the environment you're in. And that process disengages that alertness and focus to the point where it's feeling a little bit stressful. So there's a quick way to turn down the stress response. And if you do this with a sigh, so I can do my, and dial out my gaze as I exhale, that will bring your physiology right back down to, to baseline. Oh, I so, love that. So, the, you know, we, so the, the advice that we commonly hear, take a deep breath or just exhale or, um, you know, just, I don't know, take a walk or something. It's, it's generally in the right direction, but it's not specifically aligned with the biology. So if you want to really push back on stress, double inhale, exhale, proper size, panoramic vision, and those can be done in real time. In fact, panoramic vision can be done covertly. You can be in conversation with somebody. They can say something that really upsets you and you can feel yourself getting agitated and you're not going to run off and do breath work. You might be able to sneak in a, a proper sigh or two, but you can always do this panoramic vision. It's very covert. Mm. And all of these things are, are really fast. They don't, require, they don't require any learning for your biology to learn how to do it. You, you have the biological systems to do this the first time and every time. We've just never really been taught because we didn't really know the science. Oh, those are so helpful. I think that the audience is going to really benefit from those and I, myself as well. Such good stuff. Will you talk a little bit about light in the brain? I think that the stuff that you guys have, and then I want to talk about sleep. Yeah. So, um, so those topics kind of go together, but basically, um, you know, we are what's called a diurnal species. We are not nocturnal. We were designed to be awake during the daytime. So I realized that for new parents and for yeah, I know. Um, yeah. easier said and than for done. <laughs> first responders, medical staff, and so forth, that you can't always um, do this. But as much as possible, you want to be awake during the daytime and asleep at night. That's kind of a duh. Um, and as much as possible, you want to get light in your eyes during the day, and you want to get as little light into your eyes um, at night for a couple reasons. First of all, light in the morning, in particular before 9 a.m., and you have to view it. Uh, it's not um, light to the skin. Light in the morning stimulates a timer in your brain that sets the, the time on when you're going to feel sleepy and go to sleep. So when you wake up in the morning, I highly recommend if you can get outside to do it, you can do that safely, go outside. But if not, do it through a window. Get some sunlight in your eyes. It sounds so basic, but we actually have a, a set of neurons. They're called melanopsin cells if you want to look them up. They were discovered by a number of groups, but one of them is our, our friend Samer Hattar at the National Institutes of Mental Health, who I've, you've met and is a, a terrific researcher in this area. These cells are not for looking at shapes and colors. They inform the brain about daytime. And then the brain informs every organ in your body about when it's daytime and when it's nighttime. Your body's like a factory. And some of your organs, like your liver and your lungs, have to be active at certain times and other organs like your heart and your spleen have to be active at different times. So your lungs and your heart have to work all 24 hours around the clock. Your spleen has a clock. Your liver has a clock. Your brain has a clock. You need to see light early in the day and ideally it's sunlight in order to set those clocks. If you wear sunglasses, take them off. As long as you can do that safely, you know, don't get into a car crash because of this, but take them off. Never look at any bright any light that's so bright that it that it hurts to look at, but get two to 10 minutes of bright light in your eyes early in the day. That causes the release of, of hormones and neurotransmitters in our bloodstream that will make us alert and attentive. And it creates a timer so that around 16, 14 to 16 hours later, you're going to start to feel sleepy because your brain is going to start secreting the, a different hormone called melatonin. So the steps are get light in your eyes early in the morning, 
doesn't have to be sunrise if you're not a super early riser, because I'm not, so I'm not gonna push people to do that. Get some sunlight in your eyes, two to 10 minutes. Then throughout the day, try and, and get You're looking as much directly light. at the sun. Okay, it doesn't if have to be going directly into your eyes, but it, ideally you'd get sunlight into your eyes. But if you can't, get outside and get some bright light. Now, people right. always wanna know exactly how long and exactly how, look, if you're, if it's winter and you're on a snowfield in Colorado and it's a bright light on reflecting off a snowfield, it might only take 30 seconds to set this whole system in motion. If it's Scandinavia in the depths of winter, you might even need to add artificial bright lights um, to enhance this. But two to 10 minutes of, of sunlight exposure early in the day should really um, do that. And then toward evening, you want to also get some light in your eyes right around sunset, late afternoon, two to 10 minutes. Sun, sunglasses off, um, that's helpful. And it's helpful not just for setting these clocks, but these clocks are responsible for immune function, they're re re responsible for feeding clocks, metabolism, um, mental operations, meaning your learning and memory is gonna be better. I mean, there are really good data to support all this. And, and this is a very important and, doing those two things, light in the morning, light in the afternoon, is going to improve your sleep. There's hey, what time is the uh, afternoon one again? Sorry, I missed that. Sometime in the late afternoon, usually between you know 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. Again, this is going to vary by time of year because in Scandinavia sure. in summer or in Los Angeles in June, you can get some light in your eyes at 7:30 in the afternoon. Got it, it. That's if you're in Australia at the same time of year, it's going to be hard to do that at the equivalent okay. time. So, so it's so that's why it's hard for me to give really strict times, but two to ten minute duration, get some light in your eyes. Um, almost everybody experiences a fairly immediate positive effect from this mood, wow. slight shift in improvement in sleep, uh, just from one or two exposures. There's a study that was done that was published in Current Biology, an excellent journal, showing that all the screen time and the staying up late was disrupting people's circadian rhythms. Um, the circadian just means about 24 hours. Um, Cortisol rhythms, endocrine rhythms of melatonin were disrupted, can disrupt testosterone and, and estrogen production in women. Two days of doing this morning and evening light viewing completely restored those, um, those mechanisms to, to normal. In okay, humans. Question, question for you. So um, I, since I learned this from you, I've been trying to do it and I've noticed it's been incredible. My question is, so Jax will wake up in the night sometimes if I look at my phone, it's on the dimmest setting, brightness. I look at it for a second to see what time it is. I put it down. H how is that? I know that you said before that our child rearing and taking care of our kid is like the most important thing, obviously. But right. is that is that having an effect on me? If can, Am I counteracting it by doing the morning and the night sun looking? Okay, so there's a third thing. So I give you two do's. Do look at the sun in the morning. Do look at the oh, sun yeah, in the I... afternoon and evening. No, that's okay. Um, and then there's a big don't. And the big don't is avoid bright light between the hours of 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. Ideally between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. But some people are night owls. Look, I like to stay up late. I, I have Argentine heritage. And so my natural rhythm is to be up early, to work, take a nap in the afternoon, and then stay up late working. I drink co I personally drink coffee at 5.30, 6 p.m. sometimes. And God, stay up that until would be one or two, and then I'm up at seven, and then I'm tired in the afternoon. That's just the way, I, that, that's what works best for me. So I, I'm not dogmatic about, you know, being an early bird or, or you know, whatnot. Here's the story with light between 11 p.m. and, uh, and 4 a.m. Um, the same group, Samar Hattar's group at National Institutes of Mental Health, as well as David Burson's, discovered that bright light exposure between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. actively engages a circuit in the brain that triggers depressive symptoms. It lowers dopamine and it creates deficits in learning and memory. They showed that very convincingly. So if you look at your phone on the brightest setting at two in the morning, one time, it's not going to make you depressed. It's not going to disrupt your learning and memory. I'm talking about chronic behavior over many days in a row. Okay. So there are a couple things that you can do that everyone should do in order to offset some of the bright light viewing that we're all doing between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. So if you're really strict, 
10 p.m. would roll around, you would dim all the lights in your house, and by 11 p.m. it would be like a cave. Most people aren't gonna do that. Looking at light in the afternoon is, has been shown in scientific publications to offset some of the negative effects of bright light in the middle of the night. So you're kind of protecting yourself a bit. This makes sense because the body and brain want to, to cue to something. They want to anchor to things. And so the more, they can, the more things they can anchor to, the better. Light comes up in the morning. Light goes down in the afternoon. Then it's dark at night. And so if you're giving it confusing signals, your, your physiology is going to get confused. So the more consistent signals you can give it, the better. So getting that bright light in the morning and afternoon will protect you partially, not completely, against some of the negative effects of bright light in the middle of the night. Now, there are a couple things that you can do at zero cost. It just takes a little bit of time to make your home environment, or even if you're traveling a hotel environment, more um, friendly to your biology and not as detrimental. First of all, if you ha are going to use lights in the, at night and until 4 a.m., Try and keep them dim. That includes dimming the setting on your phone, putting it on night mode. Use yellow lights as opposed to fluorescent lights. Fluorescent overhead bright lights are the worst. They have a flicker rate that can cause headache for some people. The blue light um, can be especially bright. A lot of people say, well, I wear blue blockers. That protects me. It'll help you a little bit, but really just avoid bright light between those hours by dimming all the lights in your home. And try and set the lights physically low in the environment. The cells in the eye that trigger all these mechanisms that I've been talking about, they sit in the lower half of the, your eye and they're designed to look at the upper visual field at the sun. So if you have overhead lights on the ceiling, that's worse than if you have lamps on tables or lamps okay. low in the room. And okay. Scandinavians have known this for a long time um, because in the winter months, they're very familiar with something called seasonal affective disorder, which is a clinically diagnosed depression. They're also familiar with what happens in the spring and summer where the, light, the day length gets much longer. There's a lot of light and people become super energetic. Sometimes people even become a little manic. So light controls our mood and we need that happening at the, at the correct times. If you need two more little incentives for doing these light viewing behaviors during the day and avoiding light in the middle of the night, there are two findings I, I find especially interesting. First of all, there was a paper just published in the journal Nature, which is a great journal. But in science, you know, in, the, in football, they have Super Bowls. You get Super Bowl rings if you win. In science, they're, um, in the field of science, we have the journal Nature, the journal Science, and the journal Cell. Those are kind of represent our Super Bowl rings. Good to know. So, Good to know. so this is a big win um, discovery. Showed that light viewing behavior, especially in developing kids, establishes the brain circuitry responsible for feeding rhythms and metabolism. Mm. And so if you want to keep your metabolism healthy, you want to keep your appetite regular, and you want to veer away from things like type 2 diabetes, one of the things that you can do, not the only thing, but one of the things you can do is to get light at the correct times of day and avoid it in the middle of the night. Here's why. Bright light in the middle of the night stimulates a brain area called the habenula, H-A-B-E-N-U-L-A doesn't matter what the name is, but if you want to look it up, you're welcome to. The habenula triggers this depressive-like symptomology, and it communicates to our pancreas. There's a direct connection between our habenula and our pancreas, and the pancreas is involved in blood sugar regulation. This is why people who are nocturnal or who have shift work or who aren't sleeping well, their appetite gets really messed up. Sometimes people find that they're putting on more adipose tissue, more body fat when they're eating less even, because everything is all out of whack. Oh. So avoid bright light in the middle of the night. If you see it once or twice, it's not the end of the world, um, but try and avoid that on a regular basis. So I call this the Netflix effect, right? I'm watching this new series on Netflix and I'm absolutely, I, I'm, I'm not able to turn them off. They're so good. Wh which and one is it? It's called Fauda, which is, uh, it's a, um, uh, it takes place in the Middle East and it's kind of a, uh, it's about special uh, Israeli special forces and, okay. and um, some of the, it, Rory, and it's, love a, it. it's, it's very good. It's done very well. And, um, but it's, it's killing my sleep because, you know, one thirty in the morning, I'm, you know, I'm trying to dim <laughs> the screen one more and, you know, Netflix has done this very diabolical trick where it used to be, if you wanted to watch the next episode, you had to, you're depressed about it. Now you just, it goes, and you can even skip the intro. So it's like, 
you're just cycling right into it. So <laughs> points to you, Netflix. You got me. I'm a neuroscientist and you still got me on this. So, so these, these practices that we're talking about, they're so foundational. They take, if you were to do all these things, morning light viewing, afternoon light viewing, let's say five minutes each and avoiding bright lights in the middle of the night and focusing more on dimming the lights in your home, keeping them low in the physical environment. You're really talking about 10 minutes a day and the health benefits, both mental and physical in times of COVID and out time, outside of COVID are outscale with the investment by a long shot. There, you know, I can't suggest any supplement or dietary practice that would even come close to supporting your biology in, this, in these kinds of ways and in as many ways. And when I say that, I'm saying that from the place of, of having examined the, the literature on this, the scientific studies in humans and, and in mice over, you know, over decades. Um, that's not to say that you know, I'm not trying to say uh, what an expert I am. What I'm saying is what, what we like to see in science is a center of mass, a lot of papers supporting something, not just one, one study. So when, I'm, when I say I've, I've explored this for a long time, and that's why I believe in this so strongly, is that you know, there, there's just so much data to support these practices as being good for us. And there's even you know, this thing, I, there's a psychosis that can occur when people go into environments like emergency rooms where their lights are all disrupted for many weeks on, on end. In the, it's called ICU psychosis. Um, people can literally develop symptoms of schizophrenia from getting light at the wrong times of day and from sleep deprivation. And it's reversed when they leave the hospital. I, I realize I'm talking a lot, but I promised one other incentive for doing this, which is, um, believe it or not, the turnover of cells in your hair, skin, and other areas of your body, the, the production of new cells, new healthy cells to replace the dead ones, so-called stem cells, we all have stem cells in us is controlled by light viewed to the eyes. The rates of that and the timing of that. So there's so many reasons why your body health, um, everything right down to hair and skin and sleep and mood and metabolism and mental health. And it's like learning and memory. Yeah, everything. It's like th this is the bedrock of our, of, our, of our health. And so that's why I'm so... Um, I'm so adamant about this when people say, you know, what can I do to keep my brain healthy or uh, what should I be doing for my brain or how can I learn better? And I always just say, well, how's your sleep? Do you look at light in the morning? Do you look in the afternoon? All the other stuff is secondary until you're doing these things. Okay. Okay. This is huge. So kind of two questions. I, I have a question, but I don't want to spend too much time on it because I have a million other questions, but with babies. So Jax, for instance, like he is like clockwork. Like he is, it's like the circadian rhythm baby. Like he wakes up, right. he's like up um, usually at like six something and he'll go to bed at six something. It's like this 12 hour window. And sometimes if he wakes Amazing. up a little bit later, he'll go, it's like 12 hours. It's like his awake time. So I know that babies sometimes are born being confused if it's like day or night from being in the womb, but like at a certain age, are babies more in connection with the circadian rhythm? Do you know? Or, I mean, we, we wake up and we pull the blinds up and we, we both look out the window together and kind of have this morning routine. Is that something just because we've had him kind of on a schedule, but he sometimes like if, it's the sun hasn't gone down. It's like, he's waiting for it. Sometimes, like it's like yeah. all of a sudden yeah. the, sun, the sun goes down and he's like, <sighs> well, some, some people just for genetic reasons have um, strong anchoring of the circadian system. You know, there are genetic differences between morning people and night and uh, night owls. Um, and then there are people that are, you know, somewhere in between, um, you know, it sounds to me like he's, uh, it's a perfect example of nature nurture. I have a feeling that he has very strong genetics for um, strong circadian rhythm um, regularity, but also, um, like you said, you're making sure he gets light in his eyes. I remember very soon after he was born, Rory wrote to me and said, you know, should I be giving him bright light exposure? I said, well, not too bright because, you know, kids' eyes are sensitive um, and you don't want to damage the retina, but um but to the extent that you can do that safely or indirect light, yeah, I think these are really powerful mechanisms. And his nervous system is 
being sculpted right now. This is this beautiful gift of uh, neuroplasticity that children have. And so you're also giving him an environment in which there's a lot of regularity. I mean, I think all parents um, know how important a routine is, right? Mm -hmm. The routine. And the baby or the young child is not saying, oh, hey, you know, how about a feeding right now? You know, <laughs> it's their system. Their system is, is either agitated or calm, depending on what it expects. Our body is built on these rhythms. We have circadian rhythms, which means about 24 hours. We've got ultradian rhythms, which means less than 24 hours. They tend to be about 90 minute rhythms where we can focus pretty well for about 90 minutes. And then we generally need about 30 minutes of defocus to be able to focus again. Um, the brain and nervous system and body just work this way. It's not designed to just be on, 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 and then off. And um, I think you're, it's a real blessing that, that he has these uh, you know, 12 hour nights of sleep. I think um, there are parents out there that are, will probably be envious of that. But oh no, it's um, that's wonderful. The sleep. Yeah. I, I have got to clarify the sleep. He does not stay asleep for the whole uh, I 12 see. hours, I see. but he always goes up. He, he will go back to sleep quickly, but he does wake up in the night, but he goes to bed and wakes up like with, with some night wakings. Like, I see. So I well, can't that, say I that see. he's sleeping super well, but He's, I mean, he's, he's doing really well, but, um, but it is interesting as far as going to sleep and waking up, it very much is, is like clockwork. Got it. One thing about wake, um, about sleep, as long as we're there, you know, a lot of people, um, get really stressed and frustrated when they wake up and that's part of the reason they have a hard time going back to sleep again. Um, one of the practices that I'm a huge fan of in my own life, cause I, I, um, I pull a lot of all-nighters. I work late. I've got a, um, you know, there are various times when I'm woken up in the middle of the night. Um, is a practice called yoga nidra, mm -hmm. um, and which literally means yoga sleep. And there are some uh, scripts that you can get on YouTube. There are also apps and books and things like that. But um, I use a couple scripts on YouTube. One is a 10-minute script. Another is a 30-minute script. I'd be happy to send you the ones that I use. Yes. Please. What they are is you just listen to the script. They actually tell you not to fall asleep, but if you do, it's okay. And it teaches you to deliberately relax your nervous system and turn off thinking and doing. They actually, there's a line in most Yoga Nidra scripts that says, shift from thinking and doing to being and feeling, which sounds very new agey. But, um, but it's actually an important point, which is that our forebrain, which is involved in anticipating, okay, you know, when does Jack's need to be fed? What's you know who's going to go to the grocery store? Have we communicated with our parents? What's going what's going on in the world? Say that's all thinking and all the doing. Whereas that when we fall asleep or when we need to get back to sleep, we need to turn off thinking. Now it's very hard to turn off thinking. Turning off thinking is about as difficult as me telling you not to think about something, and of course you're going to think about that thing. So yoga nidra is a I've found to be a very powerful tool for relaxing the nervous system by giving you just enough to think about in terms of um, sort of like a body scan and focusing on your breathing that your mind is occupied, but that you drift into these sleep-like states. My lab has actually been studying something kind of like this for its ability to push back on stress. And we see people's brains and bodies go into states that are very sleep-like. So I personally, from my experience, and I wanna make sure I underline from my experience, disagree that you can't recover sleep that you lost. I do, like this morning I didn't, I woke up, I did not get enough sleep. So I did a 30 minute yoga nidra script and I woke up from that or I came out of that because I wasn't asleep in it, feeling completely refreshed and renewed. So deep relaxation can help. It's not quite as good as deep sleep, but deep relaxation tools can help. And this needn't be meditation. You don't have to sit there and meditate. If you like meditation, great. What I like about yoga nidra is it's completely passive. I just sit there and listen. So I always say the best time to do yoga nidra is first thing in the morning, late afternoon, or any time of day or night. In other words, just if you do it regularly, you'll find that you fall asleep more easily, you stay asleep better, and you can recover some sleep that, and restfulness, wakefulness that you uh, – that you might have lost because you have a kid or because the world is stressful or because real life happens. So yeah, a, why for is, me, it's been a total game changer. Yeah. What, like, I know this is kind of obvious, but why is sleep so important? That's a great question. You know, it, there's still a, a bit of a mystery as to why exactly we need sleep, but 
um, there's a molecule in the brain called adenosine. Um, and adenosine accumulates um, during different phases of sleep and wakefulness. And it tends to, there are pathways in the brain associated with adenosine that drive sleepiness. So across the day, there's this buildup. And then during sleep, we get to kind of, um, we get to kind of push those biochemical mechanisms um, back down to normal. Other molecules are start high in the morning when we're really alert and they kind of taper off and during sleep they get restored. And so there are a couple of different hypotheses about sleep and what it does, but here's what we know. If you don't sleep, bad things happen, right? I don't even need to explain that. I think Matt Walker's book, Why We Sleep, is a great um, modern book on that. But What's not out there are a lot of tools on how to get better at sleeping. And so everyone now knows we need to sleep more, but how do you get better at sleeping? Yoga Nidra, at least in my experience and from um, the experience of many other people, has, uh, helps you get better at sleeping. There are a few studies, and particularly one out of a, a lab in Denmark, showing that 30 minutes of this Yoga Nidra practice can restore the circuits in the front of the brain called the basal ganglia, which are involved in movement and, move, and sort of accuracy of movement and movement performance, um, that it can really enhance those circuits. So again, it's cost-free. It's about 10, 10 to 30 minutes. I do it every day. I've recommended it to a number of people who struggle with sleep and struggle with anxiety um, to great benefit to them um, is what they tell me. And again, it's, and I have no affiliate, what's kind of fun for me as a scientist is I have no affiliation to, um, first of all, mother nature owns the patent for sunrise and sunset. I, I don't, um, uh, yoga nidra is just freely available out there, um, on YouTube and other sources, avoiding light. You know, we could talk supplements and nutrition at some other time, but these are all things that are just out there that the science tells us is of value if we apply it in the right way. Yes. All right, I want to switch gears a little bit unless there's anything else that you feel like you need to say about sleep. Um, no, although I would caution people against supplementing with melatonin um, because melatonin can help the transition to sleep, but it doesn't help you stay asleep. And melatonin has another powerful effect that most people aren't aware of, which is that it suppresses puberty. So especially for kids, talk to an MD. I'm not, I always say, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not prescribing anything, but I'm, I'm a professor. So I profess a lot of things, but mm -hmm. talk to your medical doctor and if, and make sure that they know that melatonin isn't just the sleepiness hormone. It's also the hormone that suppresses puberty in kids. And there's a great review that was published that I'm I'd also be happy to pass to you, Sarah, that we maybe we could post a link to, which talks about some of this. I mean, I'm shocked that you can just walk into a store and buy melatonin and it doesn't have any kind of warning on the label about this. So especially for kids, um, th yeah. think about that. Um, I just want to mention that I don't have anything against the melatonin industry, but I think that people should be aware of what they're doing. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So that's okay. about it on sleep. Yeah. Great. So I've heard you say now um, that it's actually a really good time for neuroplasticity, which I thought was interesting. Can you talk a little bit about why, why you say that? Yeah, so I um, I do a little bit of teaching of neuroscience on Instagram, and I um, and I had a post that said we we are right now in a state of heightened neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to change in response to experience. It, you can have negative neuroplasticity. You know, a head injury is going to give me plasticity. It's just not the kind I want. The kind that we, you want is adaptive plasticity. And right now we are in a state where our brains and our bodies are primed for learning. They're primed for change because once we reach adulthood, about 20, age 25 or 30 or so, the brain doesn't want to change that much anymore. It will only change in response to things that are clearly different than everything we've been experiencing up until then. So the brain wants to wire up and then just work. It doesn't want to have to rewire, but it can rewire. That's this gift of neuroplasticity. And the trigger for neuroplasticity is heightened vigilance and enhanced focus. We are never going to forget this time of COVID-19. Now, it's, it's, a, it's a negative thing generally, right? I mean, there will be silver linings in it, but much like for those of us that lived through 9-11 or the Challenger 
uh, space shuttle explosion. I'll never forget those moments, right? For people that were alive during the Kennedy assassination, they're what are called flashbulb memories. They're the same as one trial learning where you touch a hot stove and it burns and you never go near it again. You eat the, you know, the, whatever the, um, the cream of leek soup and you go home and you, and you get sick to your stomach. You can bet you're not ordering cream of leek soup again. And that's because of neuroplasticity, one trial neuroplasticity. That's the dark side of neuroplasticity. The positive side is that right now, because we're in this state of heightened alertness and awareness and quite understandably increased levels of stress, we are able to learn things and reshape our nervous system more readily. So that could be learning, I don't know, maybe you want to write poetry. Maybe you want to learn um, to be a better listener. Maybe you want to... um, learn a new physical skill. Maybe you want to learn how to support your neighbors and family. Whatever you're going to concentrate your energy on, your nervous system is going to get much better at that, much faster than it normally would under conditions of calm. And that's just because neuroplasticity was designed to change us to adapt. So we are all right now in this heightened state of plasticity. A lot of people are saying, well, I'm just so stressed. I got so much going on. I can't think about like learning a new language. I agree. I just want to emphasize that you're in this state, we're all in this state, and little small things are going to make a big difference in this time. The ability to uh, focus on something deliberately right now is going to have a permanent rewiring of the brain in a good way. And so you can direct that plasticity. So I call it self-directed adaptive plasticity. You can control how your brain changes. Cool. And so for, and for, Obviously, we don't want to make people feel pressured to go learn a new language, but if you feel so inspired, I mean, now's a really great time to do it. And like you said, it is a silver lining that, um, you know, if you have a little extra time on your hands, it could benefit you. Uh, are there- well, and for people that are, oh, I was just going to say, for people that are agitated and stressed, one approach is to try and calm yourself. The other is to take that agitation and apply it to something. You know, there are days when I'm, where I'm exhausted and stressed um, cause I'm a human being and there are days where I'm agitated and stressed and the best thing I can do is go for a run. There are mm-hmm. days when the best thing I can do is rest that everybody has to decide what the best approach for them is at any given time. Sure. Um, with kids in neuroplasticity, obviously they're like kind of in their prime and they're creating all these new neural pathways. Are there things or activities or environments like that you would, either know as a scientist or you would imagine would be great for us to do with our kids. I mean, Jax is nine months old, 10 months old. Um, Any suggestions you have since we have all this time with Jax at home? Sure. So my early, the early phase of my career was as a developmental neurobiologist. So I didn't even know that. Yeah. So I studied essentially everything that happens between when sperm meets egg and then you get a, a, a kid and then an adult. So about brain plasticity, my scientific predecessors, um, where um, I trained in that we have scientific lineages and uh, two guys named David Hubel, Torsten Weasel, and they got the Nobel Prize for showing that visual experience early in life shapes the brain permanently. Um, something, they identified what are called critical periods, critical periods for development and learning. And then a woman by the name of Carla Schatz, who still, um, who worked with David and Torsten and who is a colleague of mine at Stanford, coined the phrase fire together, wire together, which is really um, a beautiful phrase to, that supports what we know is happening during development, which is that in kids from birth until about age 20, um, but especially in you know, the nine, you know, six to nine month age out to about 15 or 16, the brain is incredibly plastic. It's, it's changing even just res- in response to passive experience. So unlike adults where we really have to focus really intensely to learn new things. In kids, it's just their brain is just naturally plastic. They're learning. Soon, Jax will learn words that you didn't teach him. The the people who study language learning will will tell you that they'll come home from school and you'll say, well, how did you learn that? They didn't even teach you that. Or or did they even teach you that? The the brain is is coming up with all sorts of self-learning algorithms. It's just, yeah, so cool. It's like the coolest thing. Maybe I'll go back to studying neural development yeah. someday. Um, it is absolutely the coolest thing. And during that time, you know, it, Carla Schatz and at the, during the um, Clinton administration, there was something called the, because that's when um, this uh, government initiative called the first six years 
was really set forth that was just really based on developmental plasticity said you want to give kids enriched environments you know play them classical music um, play with toys give them movement do all these things the, the intention was right but I think it went a little bit far the, the idea isn't that you want to bombard a kid with lots of different sensory stimuli you know some parents took this to mean okay I'm gonna play my kid uh, classical music plus they're gonna I'm gonna force them to do a lot of movement stuff. Plus they're going to, I'm going to teach them to cook. They, the nervous system doesn't like that. It doesn't like bombardment. Oh, and if I you would. look at the way kids play, they're very deliberate and very focused in their play. They're not playing with trains and they might bash the trains and play with them and depending on their age. Um, but they're not doing everything. They're, they're not doing a lot, a little of everything. They tend to do things in a very focused way. And so the kind of exposure that the research shows is supportive for neuroplasticity in kids is going to be exposure to a lot of different things, but letting them follow some of their natural inclination toward drawing if they like drawing, or when they tire of drawing, maybe pivoting towards something in music or play. So exposure to sights and sounds and colors and shapes, all that stuff is going to be really helpful. But the nervous system is so primed for learning that at that age that it's unnecessary and it actually can be kind of counterproductive to force extra stimuli in. Kids mm -hmm. will naturally forage for the things that they want. Now, you never want to put them in a black box, but you know, no, hopefully nobody's doing that anyway. <laughs> so um, give them exposure to things and then let them, uh, and then watch their natural inclination mm -hmm. to engage okay. with them. I think that's what the, the plasticity literature really, really suggests. Now, as a, I, because I have a, a position in the Department of Neuroscience, but also ophthalmology, I am obligated to say this. Um, if a kid has, for instance, a, um, a strabismus where one eye is looking off in the, uh, is kind of deviating or uh, cross eye is sometimes called, but sometimes they're deviating, or if there's a cataract or an occlusion where the eye is cloudy, it is very important we know to that the child be seen by an ophthalmologist fairly early because a lot of those things can be corrected if they're done early but not late and so um, that is important so if there's something where a parent suspects that a, a child um, either can't hear or see or there's some sort of sensory deficit be, it's very important to, uh, to address that early because because of this plasticity because ultimately the brain will rewire and say well I can't see through that eye or my or the eyes aren't aligned very well and so the brain mechanisms for binocular vision and being able to see depth will just not develop. And if you catch it early, you can reverse it. So um, I, I do feel like since hopefully a couple of parents will, will hear this, um, it is important to address those things early and not assume that everything's gonna correct on its own. Okay, awesome. Um, so switching gears again, I remember we were uh, at, we were at a meeting and um, we were talking about habit change and I, I think it was posed like, is there anything like any, but you have any thoughts about like kind of habit change or like things that are important to it. And I said, I felt like the subconscious mind was such a big part of how we need to, a thing we need to address in order to change our habits. Because from the research that I've done through just reading and listening, um, that seems to be this thing, like this, this downloaded information that's kind of like playing underneath our behaviors that we're not actively able to teach in a, the same way that we teach our conscious mind. And I remember be saying this and kind of everybody looked at me like I had like three heads, <laughs> like, what are you talking about, Sarah? Like, okay, like moving on. And then I remember after the meeting, you kind of came over and you were like, yeah, like I think some, you, you some in some way encouraged that this thread that I had brought up and it made me feel so much better because I was like, oh my gosh, like I just, I seemed like I said something that was like not in alignment with the room. But um, do you believe, so Bruce Lipton is someone that I've had on the show and he talks a little bit about like how the only way to really change the subconscious mind is to uh is through repetition is through energy psychology or is through hypnosis um because that's how we're basically learning the first six or seven years of our lives it's like this 
hypnotic state and we're not in this conscious brain yet. Do you believe, is that in alignment with kind of your, I know that's not specifically what you study, but is that in alignment with your beliefs? Yeah. So I, I'm a, the subconscious is very real. Uh, most of what we do is not conscious. Um, I have a colleague, um, I mentioned him earlier, but I'll mention him again, David Spiegel, um, who's a MD and psychiatrist department of psychiatry at Stanford. He is a world expert in the use of hypnosis for pain management, smoking cessation, trauma, even breast cancer outcomes. He's, he's, um, this is work that's published in very stringent, high quality peer reviewed journals. So um, this is not stage hypnosis, this is clinical hypnosis. And I, I can't speak for him, of course, but I think David would um, argue that uh, the subconscious is immensely powerful and it can be tapped into through things like hypnosis. Um, there's a phenomenon um, called blindsight that I think really hammers this home. So there are people who are form blind. They, they cannot see shapes. They, they're blind. Um, and if you give them a choice of, let's say, uh, let's say you give them some red blocks and some blue blocks, sounds like a kid's game, but you do this with, with adults and you say, um, you know, uh, just why don't you pile up the red blocks on one side and the blue blocks on the other? And they say, well, I'm blind. I can't see them. You say, well, here, feel them. You can feel them. Yeah. You say, well, just pile them up. Just do it. And they say, well, I'm blind. And they say, well, just do it. Just guess. Not always, but there are many of the, such blind patients that their stacking of the blocks is far better than chance. Far better mm -hmm. than chance. Likewise for motion, they will, um, if you say, give them a choice of dots moving up or dots moving down, a simple, you know, simple experiment, and you say, okay, um, tell me which side the dots uh, moving up are on, and you keep switching it, obviously. Um, and they say, I don't see any dots. You say, just guess. They're like 80% correct. So they have what's called blind sight. Um, there are subcortical pathways that allow them to, to do things, to see things and perceive things without knowing. So it's knowing without knowing. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the tricky part about the subconscious is that the moment it becomes conscious, it's no longer subconscious. So it's hard to know when you're in a subconscious state or not. Um, mm -hmm. We know when you're unconscious, which is when you're asleep, but unless you're lucid dreaming, of course, but um, it's been a tough field to um, tack down, but it's starting to, to gain some ground. I'm not, I'll have to listen to this episode. I'm excited to do it. I haven't um, I've followed uh, Lipton's work, um, not because it isn't interesting, but just because I've been occupied with other things. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of great stuff out there. So I'll have to check that out. But the subconscious is very real. And, um, you know, I, I'm also a big believer in psychology. And I think, I think despite um, being a controversial character, I think, you know, Freud and Jung were brilliant in their assessment of the mind. There's been, and there are many others too, of course. So brain science and the notion of subconscious are not divorced from one another. If anything, neuroscience supports the fact that there are many functions in the brain occurring, important functions beyond just breathing and heart rate, et cetera that are below our conscious detection. And the brain's job is really to move stuff from conscious awareness to reflexive subconscious. It, yeah. I mean, it's a lot of work to think about what we're doing all the time. Sure. So that's kind of the job of the brain. So when you brought that up at dinner, I thought, oh, this is fantastic, yeah. yeah. And, um, and as a neuroscientist, I think um, discussions about the subconscious are, are entirely valid. And I think that they, um, they were likely to gain more attention in the, in the years to come. Do you think um, that listening to like subliminal messaging or some sort of recording that is giving is trying to contact your subconscious to reprogram a more positive outlook or whatever you're trying to fix? Maybe it's procrastination. Maybe it's like some relationship with money. Maybe it's you know just being more positive about your life in general. Do you think that can be an effective tool to reprogram? I do. I think there need to be some constraints on it. Um, I think again, just passive listening is not likely to have a huge effect. I so think not like that, while you're asleep, for instance. Um, you know, it's interesting. Hypnosis. There, there are some good data that hypnosis can um, incorporate what some people call suggestions or intentions. I've talked to David about this, and 
Um, you know, hypnosis is really about narrowing context so that you're really focused on the context of one thing that you're working on. Um, so let's say I'm in a room and this room has lights and it has tables and it has computers and so forth. But if I'm under hypnosis, the hypnotist can limit my, the context of what I'm focusing on to something very narrow, like just the conversation. And then within, within that context, there's a heightened ability of the brain to change in response to, um, I don't want to call them suggestions, but particular goals. So maybe it's smoking cessation. I mean, the data are, are pretty strong on this. Um, I'm a big believer in um, clinical hypnosis. Yoga Nidra incorporates uh, intentions. Um, here's what we know for sure, that the ability to rewire the nervous system requires focused attention and it requires deep relaxation and that these intentions as we're calling them or um, things that you hear in hypnosis the, or even if it's affirmations those are going to have a more powerful effect if they arrive when you're in a state of deep rest or calm now whether or not they can get into your nervous system and reshape it when you're completely asleep i don't know but um and I don't know because for two reasons. One is I don't think there's been a lot of work on this and laboratory work. I'm sure there's been a lot of practical work. And the other is um, I might not know because I just haven't done the homework on it. And so I don't, I, I, I know a few things about this area, but I'm not um, an expert in it. So I just, you know, if I haven't paid attention to it, it's not because it isn't it's interesting. I've just um, focused on it. Yeah, a lot of stuff going on over yeah. there <laughs> all right so it's a, it's a fun busy place um i know i'm just i want to be cognizant of your time i just have a couple more things that i want to talk about sure. really quickly i just want to touch on the, this idea of neuroscience and gratitude because gratitude for me is probably one of the things i turn to every single day like when i'm feeling stressed or anxiety and on i think it was written on your instagram you say Gratitude is not just a social construct. It is a real neurobiological phenomenon that is powerful for bringing deepened sense of well-being, connectedness, and enhancing our relationship to self, others, and all things. And I mean, that's something I know, but I love, I love when there's science that backs up these kind of ethereal practices and things that I love and really believe in. So you are are a proponent of gratitude as well, I yeah, assume. Yeah, big time. Yeah. Do and you have I'll, a practice? Yeah, so um, I do have a practice. You know, gratitude, uh, I like to say, is not complacency. A lot of people think that gratitude is just going to make me uh, a navel gazer. It's going to make me less ambitious. Actually, the, the, there's some good data out there that show that um, spending some time concentrating on the, the joy and satisfaction from what we already have can stimulate the release of chemicals in the brain, such as serotonin, things like dopamine, things like that, mostly the serotonin system, that make us feel good. And that feeling good makes us better able to lean into the future and into pursuing things and into supporting other people and goals. So it actually runs exactly in the opposite direction as you know, navel gazing and becoming complacent. Um, the, the gratitude practice I like, and I'm not very regular about this, I, I, I guess, is when I first wake up in the morning, I'm, you know, confession here, my first thoughts of the day are rarely good. They're, they're usually like all the things I have to do or what I didn't sleep well or whatever it is. So um, it, not that I didn't sleep, but it's just stress. I think I, I just generally wake up a little bit more stressed than I would like. So I deliberately thank, you know, sort of, I feel very grateful. I focus on my my sensations and gratitude for the fact that a I'm waking up. <laughs> That's you know I'm alive. Um, you know, I'm here. Uh, I'm breathing. I'm ambulatory. Um, you know, and then I try and just pick one thing that I want to be in better, deeper relation to, positive relation to, and. Um, uh, these days, because my bulldog is old and I don't know how much more time I've got him, I focus on him and I just really mm -hmm. am just in full gratitude for him or the work that I'm so blessed to be able to do being a brain explorer and to get paid to be a brain explorer. Or mm -hmm. um, it could be friends, could be family, could be anything really that you have in your immediate sphere. And and then I usually just move on in, into life. I don't tend to write things out that much. I I should. 
Um, cause I know that's even more powerful, but that's my gratitude practice probably takes me 30 seconds or a minute. And then I'm usually, and then I'm always up and outside looking for the sun for mm. that first few minutes of the day. I do believe in sunlight before screen light. I do not like to look at the phone before I see the sun. I think it's, a, I think it's really disruptive. So that's, oh, that's my, my practice. Yeah. And there's, and there's stuff going on in our brain with that gratitude there's like oh absolutely i mean if you want to talk the science the um so serotonin is this feel-good molecule that's associated with things that we already have whereas dopamine is a feel-good molecule associated with things that we want and that we're pursuing that are outside our immediate experience serotonin and oxytocin many people have heard of the hormone oxytocin it's involved in bonding uh it comes from uh, skin contact with your child, parents. Yeah, I'm breastfeeding, you know, so I have a little so, boost of oxytocin now. Well, you know, oxytocin was designed first. It, you know, its primordial function is milk letdown. It actually controls mm. milk letdown in the mammillary ducts. Yeah. Wow. So, um, yeah. And it's involved in bonding between mother and child and father and child and mother and father or, or whatever the, the couple uh, arrangement happens to be. So, it's kind of interesting that the same and not a coincidence that the same hormone that is involved in controlling uh, some aspects of lactation are involved in, in bonding. Oh, that, that wasn't an accident. Yeah. And the other thing that, that gratitude does is it, um, and social connection is it, it protects against the release of a molecule called tachykinin. It's T-A-C-H-Y-I-N-I-N, tachykinin. Kind of, no, Y I I N N, tachykinin. I, I, I'll have to spell it out. Um, in flies, mice, and humans, tachykinin is released due to social isolation and it causes lower threshold for stress and fear. So it affects brain areas like the amygdala that are involved in stress and fear, makes them more likely to trigger fear and aggression. And it also lowers immune system function. So social connection. Even if it's not direct physical contact, is like Zoom calls like Zoom calls, yeah. Zoom calls are good. Too many Zoom calls can wreak havoc on your visual system. It can give you um, some dizziness. Um, actually, I on Instagram the other day, a, a comedian by the name of Nicole Arbor said um, was talking about digital concussion, which is the feeling of dizziness and kind of like pupils dilate and feeling zonked out from too much Zoom. And I, I love that phrase because it really, I think she's really onto something. I think there really is something kind of similar to concussion yeah. um, caused by too much Zoom, too much FaceTime. But nonetheless, phone calls? Seeing fa phone calls are great. Seeing faces is great. I'm not saying Zoom is bad or that FaceTime is bad or Skype is bad. But um, ultimately, we all look forward to a day when we can interact face to face again in mm -hmm. person. But social connection suppresses these negative hormones like and peptides like tachykinin it promotes the release of things like oxytocin and serotonin and so does gratitude so these are real neurochemicals they're wow. and not trivial ones at all cool all right i want to wind down here um i kind of have like a big picture question as a scientist so obviously you rely like your job relies on data and studies and like seeing things having the evidence in front of you to really see and understand something in your life do you find you're able to believe in things that you can't see and you can't measure oh absolutely yeah. i just uh the the my job is to as you described is to collect data you know my, my i mean my goal as a scientist is to pursue knowledge right to find find out try and tease out these mysteries of the, of the nervous system and brain and try and develop tools that are useful to people. Um, you know, in uh, everyday life, there are uh, incredible things that I experienced all the time. I mean, things that I, I would like to understand. I mean, I, on the, you know, some of them are harder, you know, I, um, I'm sure many of your listeners have had loss. Like I, I, I have the unfortunate, um, distinction of having all three of my uh, my undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral advisors all died very young. So the joke oh. in my field is you don't want me to work for you because <laughs> apparently that's it. And, um, oh, but, terrible. you know, so so I'm very familiar with, you know, I, I've been fortunate that my immediate family is still alive, but I, um, you know, and so grief is something I think about a lot, you know, like what is that feeling of 
um, uh, that happens after someone passes away that I now know from a lot of experience over time, it becomes less intense. Like, what is that? How does that work? Totally. Is it the memory of them? And I have some theories about this, that it actually has to do with the passage of the idea of someone from actionable to inactionable. Like I can't mm. like, like right now I can go outside and pet Costello, my bulldog, cause he's there after he's gone. I can't do that. And a lot of the, I'm wondering, I wonder sometimes if the grief process is really a biological process of moving things from actionable to inactionable. And it's designed mm. to be painful so that we don't continue to try and interact with that thing. But that's just mm. a theory. So that's me placing a neuroscience theory for which I have no data. Um, but a lot of life experience. Now there yeah. are positive things like, um, you know, why is it that sunsets are beautiful um, mm -hmm. as well as useful for our circadian rhythm setting? Yeah. Um, and I don't know. And and I I look at a sunset and I think about yes, there's a lot of yellow blue contrast, which is perfect for the cells in the <laughs> eye that are going to stimulate circadian. I think about that, but most of the time I'm just in um, great awe of. Mm -hmm of you know the and and in and in tremendous gratitude for the things that uh have been available to me and are available to me um there are a lot of things i wonder about including the subconscious um i'm still uh, human relationships are really fascinating and to be honest we don't have a lot of neuroscience on human on, on relationships mm -hmm. most of what uh, neuroscience has been about is about individuals and how their brains work because those are the kinds of experiments that could be done. So yeah, there are a lot of mysteries and I, I, I embrace the mysteries, you know, I, yeah. and there are a lot of things in life that I enjoy that have nothing to do with neuroscience. Um, and do you believe so, that, do you, sorry to interrupt you, but do you believe mm -hmm. that there's some, some higher, higher power or universe or thing that's like this intelligence that kind of can help guide us? That's it. That's a great question. So, uh, and I'm not going to dodge it, but I will say this. So our current director of the National Institutes of Health is a guy, uh, this is a very high level position in charge of all science funding in the United States and um, health initiatives, as a guy named Francis Collins. And, um, and he's actually a fairly religious person. Um, and he's written, if you Google his name and you just say religion, he's actually um, written some very impressive uh, essays about why, how and why he can be in this profession that's so tacked, uh, attached to concrete evidence and data, and at the same time have a connection to um, spirituality and religion. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I've been reading a lot of uh, Francis's stuff recently um, because this is something I would say for me, it's still a, um, it's still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that I, I grapple with because I certainly don't have explanations for everything. I only know what I know. I don't know what I don't know. And science and neuroscience in particular is the lens through which I've looked at life, but there are other lenses to look at life. Yeah, that's why um, I was curious you know? because it is yeah. like, there are these things that like, we're never like, we're not, I'm not gonna leave this planet having this certainty from any evidence that maybe there's some like guiding power or that everything happens for a reason is uh, something that I believe, but but how will I ever be able to prove that? I don't know, but it makes my life better. Like, oh, this is happening for a reason. What is it here to teach me? But I always wonder, I don't think in a very scientific way. That's just my personality. So I don't need that, that evidence isn't, that's not something I look for. So I always am curious with people who are very scientific and, and give us this amazing data, which I do think is important, but I just don't naturally go in that direction. If, if it's, um, more difficult for you to maybe kind of think and not difficult, but if it just how you think about these things, I just think is fascinating. Yeah, I I think about it a lot, and I think I th especially as I get, as I get older, because um, you know I I no longer am uh, demanding of myself that I um, rule out modes of thinking. I, the more modes of thinking that I can bring into my life practice, the better. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a big, big aspect to, to my personal pursuits is just to try and, you know, to learn. I love to learn. Yeah. Here's what we know for sure. There are many human beings on the, this planet now and previously that have 
um, that derive tremendous sense of well-being and um, meaning by uh, through their attachment to ideas about higher power and higher levels of organization. Whether what the biological basis of that is, I don't know, but um, clearly it's a, it's a strong effect. Mm -hmm. And so I'm I'm in always in exploration of these things. Um, you know, I, my family was a kind of a, a mix of people that were religious and non-religious. And so I've been left to, to explore the various um, options on my own. And, um, and right now I'd say it's a work in progress. I would say that anyone interested in this and how science and religion can um, sync up uh, should check out what Francis has written. Um, yes. and, and I will say, yeah, and I will say that scientists talk about this. My postdoc advisor, um, used to, we used to talk about it. You know, he had, he had this, uh, essay that he pointed me toward called the celestial teacup. Um, and there are some ideas about, um, this stuff generally. And, um, you'd be surprised to find out how many scientists have religious leanings. That's yeah. cool. You might be surprised. So, yeah. yeah. And, and of course there are many who don't and, and, um, you know, it's uh, United States and, of America, and you know, so people can make their choice. Yeah, neither way is right or wrong. I, it's more of out of curiosity that I ask. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this has been amazing. I, one thing I, um, is there anything else you want to share? I know Made For is something that is incredible, and I talked to Dave F Phillips uh, the other day as well, and he was great. Um, and you're an advisor, you're part, what is your role in Made For? You're yeah, so um, so I should do my uh, disclosure. So I run my lab at Stanford. Um, I do some consulting work separate from the laboratory, which is I, I uh, direct the scientific advisory board for Made For, which is a, um, a company that our friends Pat Dossett and Blake Mikoski started, um, which is geared toward um, behavioral practices um, that many of which have uh, grounding in neuroscience and other aspects of biology for um, rewiring the nervous system for the better and developing healthy habits and that, that kind of thing. My role with Made For has mainly been to bring together uh, a team of scientific advisors to help them, um, uh, to help the, the Made For staff uh, make sure that the, the products and the things that they're pushing out um, there into the world are uh, grounded in science and, and have a basis there and to get expert opinion and critique. Um, I, you know, my lab is, is a basic science lab. So we mainly focus on collecting data and then creating tools that I distribute uh, freely into the world um, through scientific publication and things like podcasts. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And, um, and I also teach neuroscience on Instagram um, on, at Huberman Lab, H-U-B-E-R-M-A-N-L-A-B. -E um, those are just short posts about the range of topics we talked about today, as well as many other things. Uh, we get into all sorts of fun stuff and discuss fun, exciting discoveries in neuroscience and related fields. So that's really, um, th those are the kind of the major areas of fo focus for me these days. Cool. So, and finding you on Instagram is, I enjoy, really enjoy following your Instagram account. Thank Are you. there any other social channels? You direct I'm not on. I'm not. Uh, my niece uh, has encouraged me to get on TikTok. I, oh I yeah, TikTok I need account. to I, too. I, I have not posted anything to TikTok. I will not be <laughs> dancing uh, and singing on TikTok. Um, but mostly Instagram. Um, I also have a laboratory webpage, HubermanLab.com, where, where if you want to read our scientific publications or or there's some and there are some links to um, some YouTube videos that talk a little bit more in depth about some of the, the science. Um, there are a number of things on YouTube um, and other sources on the web that can be found through Google, but mainly the Instagram and the Huberman Lab website. Um, I always try and respond to questions the best I can and in a timely way. Um, so that's where I can be uh, located. Great. Well, and I will um, put links in the show notes to a lot of you've given so many great resources throughout this interview. So I'll have links in the show notes to all of those resources and books and you know other things that I can send people to as well as your website and Instagram and all that stuff but thank you so much for this talk it has been such a long conversation you've been so sweet to bear with me with all my questions and oh no it's been a pleasure no no, no, no. Uh, I, 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 it's been a real pleasure for me 
I really appreciate it. This has been such a joy. Um, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me on. I truly appreciate the opportunity to connect with you and your guests and um, audience. And, uh, you know, locked up in a laboratory is great. That's one of the places I'm happiest. Mm -hmm. But it's wonderful to be able to um, share these ideas. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to do this. Thank you.